man, first of all, exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world, and defines himself afterwards. Welcome to Philosophers, explained by me, Stephen Hicks. This series covers major philosophers and cortex in intellectual history, especially the great classics, which are classics for good reason. From each, I've selected an excerpt, 30, 40 minutes, no more than an hour, and our purpose is to do a close reading of an important work. Today, we are turning to Jean-Paul Sartre, and his existentialism is a humanism. First delivered as a lecture in 1946, World War II has ended, cultural and intellectual life is reasserting itself in Europe, and existentialism is a rising movement. Let's go to the text. So existentialism is a humanism. Sartre opens uh, by suggesting that uh, this new movement existentialism has been subject to a lot of criticism. And as he says here, my purpose here is to offer a defense of existentialism. Over the next few paragraphs, he outlines some criticisms that he's then going to respond to in the body of the essay. First, it has been reproached as an invitation to people to dwell in quietism of despair. So existentialism uh, uh, says we should be thinking about all of these deep issues, and uh, when we think about them, we don't come up with good answers. Life seems meaningless, and so we sink into inaction. Uh, he says this is the criticism most often made by the communists. And of course, the communists are all about action, getting away from speculative philosophy. We need revolution now, so get up out of the cafe, for goodness sake, Jean-Paul, and go uh, uh, go out and do some political activism rather than philosophical contemplation. A second kind of criticism. From another quarter, we are reproached for having underlined all that is ignominious in the human situation, for depicting what is mean, sordid, or base to the neglect of certain things that possess charm and beauty. So here uh, the criticism is, you know, you existentialists, you write uh, plays like nausea, and no exit and say things like hell is other people and uh, wonder whether why one might as well not commit suicide since life is ultimately meaningless and so forth. So it's an overly negative uh, philosophy that, uh, you know, as the critic puts it here, uh, the existentialists have forgotten how an infant smiles. Another is uh, closely following on that is uh, that uh, existentialism is too isolating, too individualistic, too solitary. It's me gazing at my navel as I contemplate the meaninglessness of life and I isolate myself from other people, from causes, from the universe in, in beyond, particularly since they do a great deal of emphasis upon the, Kogito, or the Cartesian, rather, cogito, I think. The ego uh, 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 is fundamental, and of course, we know there are all the skeptical problems for the Cartesian position. If you affirm the existence of yourself, well, okay, that's fine, but can you affirm the existence of your body or an external world or other people or a god, and it's not necessarily clear, and so you end up in a kind of solipsistic position. So that's another criticism. Further, uh, from the Christian side, and this is now a fourth criticism, we are reproached as people who deny the reality and seriousness of human affairs. For, since we ignore the commandments of God and all values prescribed as eternal, nothing remains but what is strictly voluntary. Everyone can do what he likes and will be incapable from such a view of condemning either the point of view or the action of anyone else. So if we take this subjectivism seriously, I can do whatever I want. If we deny the existence of a God as a lawgiver laying down absolute and eternal commands for us to follow, then a certain kind of relativism uh, results from that and a non-judgmentalism, which ultimately then says, uh, you know, I'm not going to pass judgment and so you're not a serious valuing person anymore. So he wants to take up these charges and uh, uh, clarify what exactly existentialism is and why it is a humanism. And uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the issues, of course, is that existentialism has become trendy, and so all kinds of people are using it for all sorts of purposes. And one of the things that 
uh, Sartre and the other serious existentialists want to do is make them more precise what the philosophical doctrine is and its implications. Now, one thing uh, he starts uh, in this next paragraph with an indication of some, some impatience. He does say, look, you, you guys say that we are pessimistic and cynical about human beings and so on, but for the most part, uh, you people, particularly the Christians and, and even many people who are secular, are very cynical in your views of human nature. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll say things like charity begins at home, with the assumption there being that uh, uh, the, the, the people are not actually engaging in charity. There's a kind of hypocrisy. Other people are supposed to, but the point of that charge is to point out that you're not actually doing it. Promote a rogue and he'll sue you for damage, knock him down and he'll do you homage. I have a very jaded view of human social relations that it's about power uh, uh, and you can't really trust people and everyone's a knife stabber and so on. Or the doctrine of original sin and the badness of human beings. So all of these people who are criticizing us for uh, us existentialists for being so uh, uh, low in our estimation of human being. Look at the kinds of things you yourself say. Uh, uh, there seems to be a, a, a problem there. So what is this thing that we call existentialism? Now, he says immediately there's a complication because uh, while you know, existentialism has a reputation for being an atheistic doctrine and Probably the, the most famous of the existentialists are atheists. Sartre does acknowledge that there are some religious existentialists. What exactly religious existentialism is going to, going to evolve is, a, is an open question here. But he does note that he would include Jaspers and Gabriel Marcel as ex existentialists, but they are both Catholics. And then he contrasts those to the atheists himself, Heidegger, uh, uh, and others who, uh, who are uh, obviously existentialists but don't believe in the existence of God. So whether they are theist or atheist, he then wants to say, is not the fundamental issue. What is the fundamental issue is this formulation. What they have in common is simply the fact that they believe that existence comes before essence. Hence, the name is going to be, it's not essentialism, but rather existentialism, uh, emphasizing that existence comes before essence, or that we must begin from the subjective, that is to say we're not starting from the objective or from the intrinsic, some more contrasts to be worked out, and then what exactly do we mean by that? Well, good question, Monsieur Sartre. So he gives then a famous example of a paper knife to, to illustrate his point. So if we imagine a paper knife, uh, or a letter opener, something in that category. It's a tool that's made for a specific purpose. All right, so let's use this as an example to explicate what we mean by saying things that have essence before existence or existence before essence. So let's take the paper knife. One sees that it has been made by an artisan who had a conception of it, and he has paid attention equally to the conception of a paper knife and to the pre-existent technique of production, which is part of that conception and is at bottom a formula. Thus, the paper knife is at the same time an article producible in a certain manner and one which, on the other hand, serves a definite purpose. Let us say then that the, of the paper knife that its essence that is to say, the sum of the formula and the qualities which made its production and its definition possible precedes its existence. So, essence in the case of the paper knife precedes existence. And what we mean by that is the paper knife starts as an idea in the knife, uh, in the idea of the paper knife maker, the artisan, wouldn't, uh, who's saying to himself, wouldn't it be nice if I had something that was this shape that I could serve this particular function? And so he comes up with a conception. On the basis of that conception, he develops a technique uh, uh, for making, for bringing the paper knife into reality. And he goes, how about and makes it, and then the paper knife comes into existence. But before the paper knife existed, it was it had an essence, so to speak. It, it was a conception in the mind of the paper knife maker. And it comes into existence with a ready-made purpose, a function, something that it is supposed to do according to the conception of its 
maker. So in that case, the essence exists first, and then the existence of it comes along second. Essence precedes existence. Now, often then, traditional philosophies will say that's how we're supposed to think about human beings. Human beings uh, uh, start off as an idea or a conception in the mind of God. So next paragraph. When we think of God as the creator, we are thinking of him most of the time as a supernal artisan, skipping down a little bit. Thus, the conception of man in the mind of God is comparable to that of the paper knife in the mind of the artisan. And it's comparable this way. God makes man according to a procedure and a conception, exactly as the artisan manufactures a paper knife following a definition and a formula. Thus, each individual man is the realization of a certain conception which dwells in the divine understanding. So in this understanding of what it is to be a human being, you know, who am I, where did I come from? The answer is you started as an idea in the mind of God, and God created you in a certain way and for a certain purpose. So that's where you started. Then you came into existence with this essence already pre-built into you. So you come into existence for a certain purpose that has been predetermined by the God who made you. Now, there are some uh, uh, versions of this essentialism uh, uh, that uh, don't necessarily depend on the existence of a God. The idea here is, he then suggests in this middle section here, the philosophic atheism of the 18th century, uh, when things became much more secularistic, instead of outright theism, deism, down to some pantheisms, and then to agnosticisms and atheism. So human beings are what they are, this claim is, not because they have been created by a god, but nonetheless there is a human nature. Right? There are a set of essential features that are built into and common to all human beings, and each of us comes into existence as having that essence built into to, uh, to who we are. So now what Sartre then is going to do is to say what the existentialists are insisting upon is the reversal of that. And the reversal comes about because if you are an atheist in the first place, then you deny that there is a God who has these conceptions and you deny that there is a God who makes human beings and makes them in a certain way and for a certain person. So the way he puts it here is to say, if God does not exist, there is at least one being whose existence comes before its essence, a being which exists before it can be defined by any conception of it. That being is man. So we come into existence, but we don't have some being that has made us a certain way or made us for a certain purpose. So we don't come into existence with an essence. We just exist initially. Essence or whatever that is, is going to have to come later. Hence, existence precedes essence. So what do we mean by saying that existence precedes essence? We mean that man, first of all, exists and counters himself surges up in the world and defines himself afterwards. So the definition of what it is that I am as a man or as an individual human being, that's my essence, that's, who, that, that, that's me, but that comes later after a whole bunch of other stuff has, has happened. If, and then a very strong formulation, if man as the existentialist sees him is not definable, it is because to begin with, he is nothing. So at first, we are just existence without essence. We are not anything in particular. He will not be anything until later, and then he will be what he makes of himself. Thus, there is no human nature because there is no God to have a conception of it. Man simply is existence without any essence. Now, that is the first principle of existentialism, and this is what people call its subjectivity. Uh, so we start with the, with, the, with the subject, kind of a bare, uh, essenceless subject that just exists. That's the starting point for 
existentialism. Now, he says this is not a reproach. Sometimes subjectivism is a, is a dirty word or a, or a pejorative. Uh, but he wants to say, look, no, this, this is actually uh, the other way. You know, uh, we have a subjectivity as human beings, and that makes us unique. That makes us special by contrast. Consider a moss or a fungus or a cauliflower. Those things also just exist, but they don't exist as a subjectivity. Uh, and so already the subjectivity can't be a reproach because we were saying, well, we are more than moss, fungus, or cauliflower. We are this being that exists of a certain way, and we have certain capacities. So, but before we project ourselves using our bare subjectivity, we are not yet anything. So, next, if that subjective starting point is the, uh, the existentialist starting point, then we start to build in, from Sartre's perspective, moralizing and moral language. Notice in this next section here. If, however, it is true that existence is prior to essence, man is responsible for what he is. And that's interesting. So we start with a subjectivity, a bare existence, but with a responsibility for anything that comes next. And this is in part because we can't then say, well, I have been made by some god or by forces out there. I was made a certain way for a certain purpose, and those are not my responsibility. Instead, I am starting off not as anything in particular, and what I become, I only become that because I choose to do so, and that's going to be my responsibility. Thus, another strong formulation. The first effect of existentialism is that it puts every man in possession of himself as he is and places the entire responsibility for his existence squarely upon his shoulders. So any position that says, oh, well, you know, whatever I become, it's because I was made for a certain purpose, that's to shrug off responsibility. Existentialists are going to say, no, whatever you become, it's because of you uh, and what you do. And so it is at bottom a profoundly responsible moralistic philosophy. So now this is interesting. Because uh, one of the criticisms we know is to say, well, you know, if you're not anything in particular, you can do whatever you want. There's no God to tell you what the right and wrong things are. And you don't even have like any sort of biological nature that dictates uh, the, 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 the boundaries within which you're supposed to act. Then why can't I just uh, right, do whatever I feel like as an individual, as an individual subject? And a very interesting uh, uh, follow up that uh, Sartre immediately gets to. I mean, what if I then will that I want to be a serial killer or a mass, you know, a, a mass uh, a murderer politically or just some sort of nasty, uh, nasty human being? So he then immediately wants to say we have to be very careful in how we are interpreting this bare subjectivity that we are starting with. So subjectivism means, on the one hand, the freedom of the individual subject and, on the other, that man cannot pass beyond subjectivity. It is the latter which is the deeper meaning of, a, of, of existentialism. So it's not just the freedom of the individual subject. That's going to be more superficial. That's not the deeper meaning. So <clears throat> what is this deeper meaning? When we say that man chooses himself, what do we mean that every one of us must choose himself? But by that, we also mean that in choosing for himself, he chooses for all men. That's interesting. So when I am making a choice as a subject, I'm not choosing only as an individual. I am choosing universally for all human beings. Interesting question. Why am I choosing for all human beings and not just for me as an individual? Where is, where is this collectivity or universality uh, coming from? For, and here's then the premise, for in effect of all the actions a man may take in order to create himself as he wills to be, there is not one which is not creative at the same time of an image of man such as he believes he ought to be. So uh, in making a choice, I am committing myself to an image not only of myself, but also of man. And that's something more universal and, and, uh, and collective. So we go on, and he uh, re reiterates this point using slightly different language. If, moreover, 
Existence precedes essence, and we will to exist at the same time as we fashion our image. That image is valid for all and for the entire epoch in which we find ourselves. Fascinating. All right. How so? So if I make a choice for me, I am choosing for all other human beings and in my entire epoch, a period of time and place, whatever that uh, definition is, is going to be. Our responsibility is thus much greater than we had supposed, for it concerns mankind as a whole. All right. Now, fascinating. So we have this bare subjectivity, and in one sense, it is me as an individual with a certain measure of power and control making, uh, as a result of my decisions and actions, myself into a certain kind of being. But at the same time, Sartre is asserting that I am choosing for... Uh, all human beings and by my actions committing all of human beings to a certain image of what it is to be a human being. So then I think this is part of uh, the way of diffusing that common criticism. Well, you know, if there's no God telling anybody what to do and you are, you are, you are a free individual agent, then you can just choose all sorts of, of dark individual things. This is to provide a kind of check or a different perspective on certain kinds of choices that we otherwise might find objectionable. So he uh, gives examples of joining a trade union. Uh, when you join a trade union, uh, you, you know you're choosing a Christian one or a communist one. So that then becomes part of the commitment that you are making. If you decide, another example he gives toward the end of this paragraph, I decide to marry and to have children. Even though this decision proceeds simply from my situation, from my passion or my desire, I am thereby committing not only myself, but humanity as a whole to the practice of monogamy. And this is something that does need further teasing out because it's not clear in what way in my choosing myself to, uh, to, to, to get married that I am saying that, every, that everybody needs to get married or that marriage needs to be an option that's available to everyone or that by making marriage be the best situation for me, I'm claiming that for all human beings in my epoch, being married is the best circumstance. There are still are a number of ways in which this universal commitment or more collective commitment uh, uh, could be interpreted. And so we do need to leave this as, a, as an, open, an open question. All right, now another aspect of uh, the criticisms of existentialism or not just this uh, free choice and just do whatever you feel like subjectivity, but also it's focusing on the negative. And it's interesting then over the course of the next several paragraphs that all of the negatives that uh, uh, existentialism does put to the fore, anguish, abandonment, dread, and so forth, uh, uh, Sartre owns them, but then he wants to argue that they have sometimes, and uh, by the critics especially, been mis interpreted. And so we need to uh, unpack what existentialists mean by, by these terms. It also is interesting uh, that uh, all of these things are emotions right, or feelings. Uh, they're not rational states of mind or commitments to abstract principles. And the human beings are defined, say, as Aristotle wanted to do, uh, as the rational animal. And then passions are, 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 are important, but in some sense secondary uh, uh, to our, our essence as human beings. The existentialists are putting emotions and desires to the fore and de-emphasizing the more intellectual aspects. So... Uh, this may help us to understand what is meant by such terms as anguish, abandonment, and despair. First, what do we mean by anguish? Well, the existentialist frankly states that man is in anguish. Right? So this freedom that we find in our, our, our subjectivity is not necessarily a positive. It's not the case that say, oh, there is no God uh, you know, looking over me and telling me what to do. Therefore, I feel liberated. I feel free. I can be right, what I want. And it's a great positive thing. Instead, this is a, uh, a, a state of being that when realized that causes a deep anguish in the human being. Now, why, why is this so? When a man commits himself to anything, fully realizing that he is not only choosing what he will be, but is thereby at the same time a legislator deciding for the whole of mankind, 
In such a moment, a man cannot escape from the sense of a complete and profound responsibility. All right, and so that's suddenly a realization of the weight of responsibility on your shoulders, on my shoulders. So it's not the case that there's a God and God has planned things out and all I need to do is say follow God's commands or somebody else is making the big legislative decisions for human beings and maybe just as a good citizen I you know I follow the law and I do my part. And said I am realizing that I am the one in possession of this divine uh, small d divine uh, 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 legislative power and that the choices that I am making are making for my life and for all of human beings life and I feel that weight as a burden and it puts me in a state of anxiety or, 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 or more precisely in the Sartrean language anguish here. There are many, indeed, who show no such anxiety. All right, so there are people who seem to say, oh, good, I'm free. I can do whatever I want, and I like making decisions. Uh, uh, put, put me on the spot. I want to be the guy in power and so on. But Sartre's arguing that those people are disguising their more profound responsibility. But we affirm that they are merely disguising their anguish or are in flight from it. Now, further on in this paragraph, <clears throat> Sartre turns to the story of uh, Abraham and, uh, and God's command that he sacrifices Isaac, and he makes an explicit reference to Soren Kierkegaard's earlier, almost 100 years earlier, actually a little over 100 years earlier, uh, uh, essay on the subject of the case of, ang uh, of, of, case of anguish, uh, 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 of Abraham's anguish, rather. So, uh, there's Abraham, uh, he's now older, uh, uh, he and his wife had had some trouble having a child, but lo and behold, uh, uh, Isaac is born to them, Isaac grows to a youth, they're happy, they have someone to carry on the family name, and of course they love their child, but then the angel returns, uh, this is the angel who had told him some years before that Sarah would in fact get, get, uh, get pregnant, and that uh, uh, through uh, through uh, this this child uh, Abraham would become the father of of a mighty nation, but the angel comes back and tells Abraham that God wants him to take his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice that would be pleasing to to God. Okay, so put yourself in Abraham's sandals. You are being asked to kill someone whom you love whom your wife loves and uh, and whom you want to have you have certain hopes for 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 the future it's going to say it's an anguishing decision and you are the one who has to decide in this case it's put in the form of a dilemma you can either obey god in which case you suffer this terrible loss of your son isaac or you can disobey god uh, in which case there are likely to be certain consequences that follow from that as well. And you are the one who has to decide. Now, you do have the freedom to choose yes or no in the case of this, but this is not a happy freedom. Yay, I'm free. I get to make this choice. Instead, it's a freedom. You bear the full response for it, and you are put in anguish. And so Sartre is agreeing with Kierkegaard about the nature of this core existential circumstance human beings are. And it's not just the Abraham circumstance. This is to generalize to all of the decisions that we make in our lives. It is, it is, it is difficult. Now, you might then say, well, um, uh, you know, the, uh, Abraham's off the hook of responsibility to a certain extent because the angel, who is God's representative here, is just passing on the message from God. And so, uh, you know, it's not that Abraham has made the decision here. He just you know, it has to do what God is saying. And if, and, and if Abraham ends up killing Isaac, he's just following orders. And so, so you could try to do some sort of alleviation of the responsibility here. But Sartre goes on to point and says, well, look, uh, that already is Abraham making some choices. He's going to decide that, yes, this really is an angel. This is not just some voice in my head. I'm not just having a bad dream. And this angel really is an emissary from God. And I am going to accept God's word. I'm still on the hook, morally speaking. Uh, uh, and uh, in the absence of further evidence, there's a cognitive component to this. Sartre gives the example here of a mad woman who right, suffers from hallucinations and people are telephoning to her and giving her orders. And the doctor asks, well, 
uh, who is it that's speaking to you? And she replies, he, or she replies, he says that it's God. Okay. All right. Well, how does she know that it is God? And uh, if all she's hearing is this voice on the phone, she is the one who's going to have to decide whether she accepts that this is God's voice or not God's voice. It's her responsibility. Right, and so Sartre wants to insist, even in Abraham's circumstance, you are responsible, and that responsibility is one of weight. So he gives one other example here of a military leader who has the, you know, the freedom of making choices. We can go into battle or not go into battle. We can try this strategy or we can try that strategy, and I'm going to make the decision or I'm not going to make the decision. But that military leader knows very well that the decision he makes is, you know, he's making choices for himself, but it's also other soldiers uh, whose lives he's putting on the line. Some of them will die as a result of the decisions that he made. He bears that Wait. The anguish with which we are concerned here is not one that could lead to quietism or in, ang in action. It is anguish, pure and simple, and the kind well known to all those who have borne responsibility. So the point is going to be that action requires, of course, uh, in, this, in this human sense, in fact, moral action requires that human beings be free and that human beings then recognize the responsibility that comes with their freedom. So the existentialists insisting upon this, they're not talking about inaction or, or, or quietism, they are highlighting and insisting upon the very condition that makes genuine action possible. All right, another concept, abandonment, feeling alone, suddenly orphaned, in the universe, the death of God, there is no wise, benevolent father looking after us and telling us what to do. When we speak of abandonment, we only mean to say that God does not exist. Right? So here the idea is that psychologically we are starting from a culture, and many of us starting as individuals, from a belief in a certain kind of a, a God. And that comes to form a part of our psychology, that there's someone out there who made us, who has a purpose, uh, that it all ultimately is going to make sense, and I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and, and God is at least my co-pilot, so, so to speak. And then suddenly, if you come to believe that there is no such being, then you are all alone in this empty universe, and you have this then necessarily a feeling of abandonment. There is no co-pilot. It's just you, and you are on your own. So that also is a fundamental commitment to uh, uh, the actual existential circumstance and that emotional correlate is an essential part of it according to existentialism. All right, so if we go down a little bit further, jumping ahead, <clears throat> it's not that man has freedom. Do notice this formulation. Man is freedom. So it's not just that you are what you are and then you have this property tacked on or, or this capacity that's just an aspect of who you are. Rather, what it is to be a man is to be the exercise of one's freedom. And to the extent that one is not exercising one's freedom, indeed one is going back in the direction of being a moss or cauliflower. And so we have the freedom with it, the responsibility. Thus. We have neither behind us nor before us in a luminous realm of values any means of justification or excuse. There are no excuses. I am the chooser. I am the decider. I am the doer. This is what I mean when I say that man is condemned to be free. Right? It's not a happy liberation. Uh, it's this weight of responsibility in this abandoned circumstance. Now, he then goes on... <clears throat> Let's say, well, lots of people will then say, yeah, not really, because we don't really choose. Instead, our passions choose for us that we're made a certain way. We have strong desires, strong emotions, strong passions, uh, and those uh, uh, are, are responsible for my doing whatever that, uh, that I do. Interestingly, existentialist does not believe in the power of passion. He will never regard a grand passion as a destructive horn upon which man is swept into certain actions as by fate, and which therefore is an excuse for them. He thinks that man is responsible for his passion. So we can shape our passions, we can choose our passions, we can act on them or not act on them. We are still 
choosing uh, which, uh, uh, which passions or emotions to act on the basis of. Another negative concept here initially, and then the existentialist interpretation of it, as for despair, it merely means that we limit ourselves to a reliance upon that which is within our wills. So uh, if we think of despair, and you'll notice toward the end of this uh, paragraph, or at the actual, actual end of this paragraph, it contrasts despair to hope. So many versions of theological ethics will make hope a central virtue. And here the idea is that there is a power beyond human beings. And of course, there's not very much that we can control. And so what we are hoping is that those powers that be, the gods, that they will smile favorably upon us and that which we desire, they will bring it about and they will make it, they will make it happy. And then the idea of despair in that context then is to be hopeless, that is to say that you don't actually think that the God or, 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 or God is going to, going to make, that, make, that, make that possible. So the existentialist then is as an atheist, uh, atheistic existentialist position saying, well, of course, there is no such God. And as a result of that, we can't have hope in that old-fashioned theological sense because not only is there not a God who's going to bring about the happy realization of whatever it is that we want. There's a huge amount going on in the world beyond our control, and uh, so it's very likely that we are not going to achieve any grand values that we want to want to achieve. But we have to be realistic about it. We can't just, you know, grandiosely, uh, uh, you know, just assume uh, that whatever I, I want is going to happen. There's going to, be, going to be some sort of romantic fairy tale happy ever after somehow happening. What will happen is what I bring about, but my powers are relatively limited, and that's what I mean by despair. Okay, so <clears throat> man is nothing else but what he purposes. He exists only insofar as he realizes himself. He is therefore nothing else but the sum of his actions, nothing else but what his life is is. So this uh, profound responsibility and profound realization that we are what we make of ourselves, uh, Sartre then wants to turn uh, the tables on his critics by saying that that is what existentialism teaches and you know that that is what ex existentialism teaches and that is precisely what you are afraid of. This is why some people are horrified by our teacher teaching, rather. And so then he asks us to consider the large number of people for whom this following description is going to be true. They don't make very much of their life. Right? And uh, if they don't make very much of their life, why not? And then all of the excuses start to come out. And what they are looking for is a way to evade the responsibility that they have for not having made very much of their life. They don't like the lesson that the existentialists are presenting to them, that if they have not made much of anything of their life, it is their issue, not some other fates or whatever. So here are all of the excuses. Oh, circumstances have been against me. I was worthy to be something much better than I have been. I admit that I have never had a great love or a great friendship, but that is because I never met a man or a woman who were worthy of it. I've not written any very good books, but it is because I not, had not the leisure to do so, or if I had no children to whom I could devote myself, it's because I didn't find the man I could have lived with. So the remains within me, I'm still fine, I'm inter interpolar, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm special, I'm unique, I've got all of these potentials for all of these awesome things. I still want to believe that. So there remains within me a wide range of abilities, inclinations, and potentialities unused but perfectly viable, which endow me with a worthiness that could never be inferred from the mere history of my actions. And Sartre then consents to say, this is BS, this is nonsense. But in reality, and for the existentialist, <clears throat> there is no love apart from the deeds of love, no potentiality of love other than that which is manifested in loving. There is no genius other than that which is expressed in works of art. 
So it's in the doing, and as the doing is in behind the commit, uh, uh, presupposes the commitment. The commitment presupposes the choice, and that is up to you. If you haven't made the choice, then you haven't made the commitment. You haven't done the doing. You haven't done anything. You are not yet any. There is no residual potentiality you that is somehow special and worthy, absent all of those other things having happened. In life, a man commits himself, draws his own portrait. There is nothing but that portrait. No doubt of this thought may seem comfortless to one who has not made a success of his life. That's the sticking point of ex existentialism for many of the critics. Sartre is charging. Okay. Um, <clears throat> very philosophical section uh, coming up a little bit later. I'm going to jump down to it. This notion of subjectivity, uh, our de point, point of departure is indeed the subjectivity of the individual and that for strictly philosophic reasons. And at the point of departure, there cannot be any other truth than this. I think, therefore I am. So saying that Descartes in the 1600s, early modern philosophy got it right. That is the starting point for the human project uh, and, and at the same time then the philosophical reflection on the human project. And at the point of departure, there cannot be any other truth than this. I think, therefore, I am, which is the absolute truth of consciousness as it attains to itself. So the prior certainty of consciousness, or the prior certainty of the I. That is what we mean by the subject. The subject comes first, and the subjective awareness of oneself as a subject comes first. Now, beyond that, everything else is probable. Right? Uh, outside of the Carson Cartesian cogito, all objects are no more than probable. If we recall from early in, the, in, in Descartes' meditations, I can know that I exist, but that I have a body that is physical and, 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 and distinct, uh, and in addition to my conscious self, probable that there is a natural world out there populated by objects and processes and so on. At most, that is probable that there is a god uh, out there or, or gods of any sort. All of that is probable and, uh, and maybe only possible. So the only thing that I can know for certain is this deep subjectivity. And that then has to be my not only my my, my metaphysical starting point, but also my epistemological or cognitive starting point. Now, but the subjectivity which we thus postulate as the standard of truth is no narrowly individual subjectivism. So we're returning to that universal subject or that collective subject point. So it's not going to be the strictly Cartesian uh, uh, subjectivity here. For as we have demonstrated, it is not only one's own self that one discovers in the cogito, but those of others too. And this is a very difficult point and a very deep point for uh, Sartrean existentialism because he has in the beginning of this section said that all I can know is my subjectivity, that I, exist. I don't even know if I have a body or if the objects that I think I'm perceiving are, are real objects uh, independently of me or if there really is a god out there. So all of those uh, skeptical uh, uh, stances uh, uh, seem to be set aside that I can know that there are other subjects and that those other subjects are the same kind of subjects that I am and that we are all part of a collective or universal subjectivity. How do we get there? That's a very hard question at this point. But he insists upon it. When we say, I think, we are attaining to ourselves in the presence of the other. And we are just as certain of the others as we are of ourselves. Thus, the man who discovers himself directly in the cogito also discovers all the others and discovers them as the condition of his own existence. He recognizes that he cannot be anything unless others recognize himself as 
such. So I'm not sure that I have hands or that this computer that I am looking at right now exists as an object independently of me, but I am certain, uh, Sartre is, is, is saying, that there are other subjects and that in some sense uh, their awareness of me constitutes my existence and my awareness of them constitutes their existence and that we can be absolutely certain of the collective or universal existence of all of them. Thus, at once we find ourselves in a world which is, let us say, that of the intersubjective. Okay, jumping down to the conclusions here. <clears throat> He's drawn an, uh, uh, an example uh, to, to uh, uh, the human project being less that of uh, being a scientist discovering a pre-existing nature that we are to follow or being a theologian who discovers God's plan for us in the world, but rather it's more like being an artist. Uh, uh, it's just on the same in the plane of morality. When we are talking about artists, we don't want to ahead of time saying, here's what your art has to be, here's what your subject has to be, here's what your theme has to be, what colors you're allowed to use, what processes you're supposed to use, and so on. Instead, the artist is totally free to create whatever he or she wants in, uh, in, in the artwork. And Sartre then is saying, by analogy and by a generalization, that is the human condition. We are all deeply free to be whatever it is that we want. It is the same on the plane of morality, that in both, that is to say art and morality, what we have to do with creation and in invention, right? It's not discovery, it's not following uh, pre-existing rules, it is creation and invention. That is another dimension of subjectivity and that's a deep uh, um, uh, existentialist point. Finally, uh, uh, an, uh, a, a positive right, concept is not just don't uh, give in to uh, a certain sort of despair, uh, grapple with your, your, your anxiety and your sense of abandonment, but strive now for authenticity. And the authentic person is going to be the person who accepts all of the above, embraces it, and makes choices and commitments on the basis of that. Consequently, when I recognize as I uh, entirely authentic that man is a being whose existence precedes his essence and that he is a free being who cannot in any circumstances but will his freedom. At the same time, I realize that I cannot not will the freedom of others. Those who hide from this total freedom in a guise of solemnity or with deterministic excuses, I shall call cowards. Much of philosophy, much of religion then, much of her shrinking from life is, uh, is a kind of cowardice and, uh, and a kind of inauthenticity, uh, recoiling from one's freedom, passing choices and responsibility for those choices off to others, expecting others to do the doing. And all of that is a kind of cowardice. Don't do that. Be authentic in this full, full sense. All right, we have to take things as they are. And moreover, when we say, uh, to say that we invent values means nothing more or less than this, that there is no sense in life a priori. There's nothing prior, there's only posterior. Night, life is nothing until it is lived, but it is yours to make sense of. The value it, of it is nothing else but the sense that you choose. So, summarizing that, existentialism is nothing else but an attempt to draw the full conclusions from an consistently atheistic position. Uh, and then this interesting, uh, striking point, it declares rather that even if God exists, and so interestingly, God does not exist from, the, from, uh, from Sartre's version of existentialism's position. And so we are totally free, we are totally on our own, and we need to take full responsibility for that. But interestingly, he wants to say that even if God did exist, there wouldn't be anything that is different. It declares rather that even if God existed, it would make no difference from its point of view because you would still be a human being with freedom. You would have to choose whether to accept uh, the existence of, uh, uh, of God, to listen to what that God says, and to, uh, to decide to follow what that God wants for you to do or not. You would still be a free agent with, 
responsibility. What man needs to do is find himself again and to understand that nothing can save him from himself, not even a valid proof of the existence of God. So in this sense, existentialism is optimistic. It is a doctrine of action.